World geopolitics is entering a new milestone with the risky nature of the war in Ukraine. The new understanding of the shifting nuclear doctrines of Russia, China, and the United States makes the horizons uncertain. For more than three decades after the end of the Cold War, the United States and its allies faced no serious nuclear threat. Unfortunately, this is no longer the case. Russian President Vladimir Putin is rattle his nuclear saber in a manner reminiscent of Soviet leaders. The issue of nuclear weapons has been putting the world at great risk since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Russia has repeatedly threatened Ukraine and the West in this regard. The West is deeply concerned about Vladimir Putin's new nuclear doctrine, which does not exclude the use of nuclear weapons in the Ukrainian conflict. The latest nuclear doctrine of the Russian Federation now states that an attack by a non-nuclear state, if supported by a nuclear power, will be considered a joint attack on Russia. In response to nuclear threat scenarios, Kiev urged its supporters in the West to intervene in the Russian-North Korea axis, which it argued would have negative consequences for the security of Europe and Asia. The West has repeatedly warned Russia in particular about this. But in recent days, it was surprisingly China that warned Russia about the nuclear issue. Beijing has been silent on the issue for a long time. But now that the Kremlin has adopted a new nuclear doctrine, China has broken its silence. Even China has said, enough is enough, against Russia's move. China reacted harshly to Russia's nuclear doctrine, exploding Putin's nuclear understanding in his face. How did China try to rein in Russia on this issue? Is the relationship between Beijing and Moscow deteriorating after Putin signaled that he would take crazy steps on nuclear weapons, just like Kim Jong? Will Putin heed these warnings from the Beijing government? We will discover the answers to all these questions and more. In the current situation, all parties concerned should remain calm and restrained and make joint efforts to reduce tensions and lower strategic risks through dialogue and consultation, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Jian said at a regular press conference in Beijing. The Chinese side has also been uncomfortable with the situation and has warned Russia with anti-nuclear statements. Just weeks before Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine nearly three years ago, Russia and China joined the other three permanent members of the UN Security Council, the UK, France, and the US, in declaring that a nuclear war could not be won and should never be fought. Since the start of the war, the Chinese leadership has repeated the joint statement from January 2022. These moves were sometimes seen as a response to occasional threats of nuclear war by the Kremlin and its allies. Beijing has also voiced its displeasure with the U.S. policy of what is known as extended deterrence, which requires the United States to use its nuclear umbrella to defend non-nuclear armed treaty allies such as South Korea and Japan. The two countries are among China's regional neighbors. China's nuclear warning to Russia may be aimed at preventing the United States from strengthening South Korea and Japan in the region by supporting them militarily. Washington has so far resisted calls from Chinese interlocutors to adopt the so-called no-first-use policy, a commitment not to use nuclear weapons as a preventive or first-strike capability or in response to a conventional attack. Moscow abandoned the no-first-use doctrine in the early 1990s. However, the U.S. and Chinese sides have tried to build trust on strategic issues by informing each other about the Beijing government's nuclear missile tests in late September and Washington's earlier this month. In addition to these efforts, the new U.S. President Donald Trump's inauguration and increased sanctions against Russia are among the preventive measures that could dissuade Putin from using nuclear weapons. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the U.S., the U.K., and the E.U., as well as Australia, Canada, 
and Japan have imposed more than 16,500 sanctions on Russia. The U.S. and Ukraine's allies responded to Russia's invasion two years ago with an unprecedented set of sanctions. They imposed a price cap on Russian oil exports, froze $300 billion worth of Russian foreign exchange reserves, and severed many links between Russia's financial institutions and the rest of the world. So far, Russian President Vladimir Putin has yet to show the world that he will adopt a credible policy on this issue, despite the U.S. and Chinese campaigns to prevent the spread and use of nuclear weapons. China's recent warnings to Putin on the nuclear issue are crucial in reining Russia in. Undoubtedly, the use of Russian tactical nuclear weapons would pose a major dilemma for China. The international backlash alone could force Beijing to rethink its unlimited partnership with Moscow. But a Russian attack would also contradict decades of Chinese nuclear policy. Since detonating its first nuclear device in 1964, China has pursued a no-first-use policy alongside a strategy of deterrence through assured retaliation. Thus, for nearly six decades, Chinese leaders have viewed the role of nuclear weapons as limited to self-defense and distinct from conventional operations and doctrines. This position was reaffirmed by Li Song, China's ambassador in charge of disarmament affairs, who said, China has made a solemn commitment that it will never, under any circumstances, be the first to use nuclear weapons. Rather than indicating any legitimate change in Xi Jinping's position on the use of nuclear weapons, these developments point more to Beijing's changing perception of the international environment. Thus, if Russia uses a tactical nuclear weapon against Ukraine, Beijing will feel the need to react publicly, if only rhetorically. What would a nuclear strike mean for China-Russia relations? While Moscow's use of nuclear weapons would put Beijing in an extremely difficult situation, it would not necessarily lead China to completely abandon its strategic partnership with Russia. While the Sino-Russian strategic partnership is certainly not without problems, it is likely to continue as long as leaders in Beijing and Moscow see the United States as their primary threat which is unlikely to change anytime soon. Some have cited recent events, such as Putin's acknowledgement of China's questions and concerns about its war in Ukraine, as evidence of cracks in Sino-Russian relations. But this is a distant dream. Most likely, Li's statements accurately reflect Beijing's position on the war. And just last week, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi had a phone call with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in which the two discussed the high level of mutual trust and solid mutual support between China and Russia and reaffirmed Beijing's commitment to the Sino-Russian relationship in the wake of Putin's threats. To this end, Beijing is likely to tolerate further escalation in Ukraine without a nuclear strike. Moreover, we cannot rule out the possibility that China would maintain its alignment with Russia, even in the event of Russia's use of tactical nuclear weapons. However, it is also possible that it would warn Russia firmly and take a more cautious and sanctions-oriented approach towards Russia in such a scenario. Beijing's reaction may depend on the specific circumstances and Moscow's justification for its use. But how much is Xi Jinping willing to pay for Putin's war? While Putin prides himself on his friendships, Xi may have reason to worry. The US has announced a series of new sanctions against banks and companies based in Beijing and Hong Kong that allegedly colluded with Moscow to help circumvent existing restrictions. Because while China does not sell arms to Russia, Washington and Brussels believe that China is exporting technology and components needed for war. On a recent visit to Beijing, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said that China was helping to fuel the greatest threat to European security since the Cold War. For them, this has become a red line. But China claims that its stance on Ukraine is neutral and that exports with commercial uses outside the war do not violate the rules. But the allegations emerged in the wake of Xi's visit to France, causing a distraction from the meeting, which should have been a center of attraction. China skeptics and China hawks have also become increasingly vocal, calling for Xi 
to put more pressure on his Russian counterpart at a time when the EU is considering its own tariffs. And the reality is that China's sluggish economy cannot afford this pressure from its trading partners. Weak demand at home means that China needs these markets abroad. All this puts Mr. Xi in a difficult position. A few days before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the two leaders announced an unlimited partnership to deepen cooperation. This made sense for brothers in arms in their ideological struggle against the West. But as the war dragged on, the alliance did not seem so limitless. First, according to analysis, the term has virtually disappeared from state media. Zhao Tong, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment, says Beijing has downplayed the borderless nature of its strategic partnership with Moscow. While China supports the goal of weakening Western influence, it disagrees with some of Russia's tactics, including the threat of using nuclear weapons. China is acutely aware of the reputational costs of appearing to offer unconditional support to Russia and is constantly evolving its strategies to enhance its perceived legitimacy on the global stage. During his recent visit to Europe, Mr. Xi said the country was neither the creator of the crisis nor a party or participant. This is what China is also telling its own citizens. Other voices from Beijing suggest that cracks may be forming over how far at least part of the Chinese public is prepared to support this borderless relationship. Feng Yujun, director of the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies at Fudan University, wrote in The Economist that Russia is certain to lose in Ukraine. In China, this is a bold view. But then Mr. Xi also hinted that he might be a peacekeeper. Last March, just days after his official visit to Moscow, he called Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to emphasize that China always stands on the side of peace. But would Russia really use nuclear weapons? On the day Russia invaded Ukraine, President Vladimir Putin stated that whoever stood in their way, Russia would respond immediately and the consequences would be unprecedented in all history. These statements are widely interpreted as a threat to use nuclear weapons. For in addition to these statements, Putin has also put his nuclear forces on special combat readiness, although he did not specify what this means in practice. According to experts, the likelihood of an escalating war in Europe that would lead to the use of nuclear weapons remains low. But if the situation gets much worse, the question of whether Russia would actually drop a nuclear bomb on a NATO country is never far from the agenda. The real answers to these questions lie, of course, in Mr. Putin's mind. But Russia has a military doctrine that should guide the deployment of its nuclear forces. According to the Federation of American Scientists, a Washington-based think tank, Russia's stockpile of nuclear warheads remains the largest in the world. According to the data, Russian nuclear warheads, including those deployed, in reserve and retired, are estimated at 5,580, compared to 5,044 for the United States and 500 for China. According to a recent non-governmental estimate, Russia has about 1,710 deployed nuclear warheads, consisting of three strategic delivery vehicles, about 328 intercontinental ballistic missiles, 12 ballistic missile submarines, and 192 submarine-launched ballistic missiles. On March 26th, Dmitry Medvedev, deputy head of Russia's National Security Council and former president of the country, cited military doctrine in laying out the circumstances that could prompt Russia to use these weapons. In an interview, Mr. Medvedev said that an act of aggression against Russia and its allies jeopardizes the country's existence even without the use of nuclear weapons. The doctrine, as we mentioned, was mostly prepared under Mr. Putin's supervision in 1999 when he was head of the National Security Council and then prime minister. It authorized the first use of nuclear weapons in certain circumstances. But to understand its full significance, one has to go back further to the Soviet Union's nuclear posture. For most of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States saw nuclear weapons as the ultimate deterrent. Strategic nuclear weapons, often aimed at cities, were so destructive that their use was almost unimaginable. The Soviet Union officially renounced the first use of nuclear weapons in 1982. 
The American and Soviet defense establishment mostly knew what each other was doing. Their doctrines of mutual certain destruction, which guaranteed that neither country could win a nuclear war, were based on mutual understanding. But America's superiority in conventional weapons, demonstrated during the Gulf War in 1990, changed all that. Unable to keep pace, Russia began to rely more and more on its nuclear forces. With the Russian army at its lowest level, the regime in the country eschewed the first non-use policy in 1993. In 2000, its revised military doctrine said that a nuclear strike could be used against an adversary whose conventional forces threatened to overwhelm Russia's conventional defenses. In theory, this greater reliance on nuclear forces was only temporary until Russia could match America's conventional forces. In practice, however, the Russian side could not keep up with the U.S., and Moscow officials began to talk about greater use of its nuclear forces. In 2009, Mr. Putin's successor as head of the Security Council stated that Russia had the option of using limited nuclear strikes against an aggressor using conventional weapons in an all-out regional or even local war. He also mentioned preemptive nuclear strikes. In other words, nuclear weapons were not the ultimate weapon to be used only in extreme situations. They could be tactical. They could be used against command and control centers or air bases, not cities. And they could inflict, in Russian parlance, special damage. In a strange inversion of ordinary words, military doctrine even calls going nuclear as de-escalation because the destruction caused by such attacks would supposedly be limited. Since then, Russia has made more explicit the circumstances in which it would use nuclear weapons. The latest version of Russia's military doctrine was amended in 2010. This amendment stipulated that nuclear weapons could be used against an opponent with conventional forces when the very existence of the state was threatened. It also seemed to be a slightly stricter requirement than the 2000 Doctrine, which authorized nuclear use in critical situations for the national security of the Russian Federation. In 2020, the Russian government argued that it viewed nuclear weapons only as a means of deterrence. According to this assessment, Russia's nuclear weapons were also supposed to be used only in conflicts with other nuclear armed states. But Russia could still use nuclear weapons against NATO and stick to the letter of its military doctrine. After all, NATO has nuclear weapons. Russia could use this as a pretext, seeing it as a threat to itself. Russia is already saying that Western sanctions in support of Ukraine constitute a declaration of war in order to launch a nuclear strike. Mr. Putin has also repeatedly argued that America and the West are trying to destroy Russia. Analysts argue that Russia could even use a nuclear device against Ukraine. This is because Russia has accused Ukraine of building a plutonium-fueled dirty bomb without evidence, even though Ukraine has no nuclear weapons. In addition, as mentioned earlier, Ukraine's Atakamas and Storm Shadow missile strikes targeting military facilities in Bryansk and Kursk, respectively, have increased the likelihood of Russia's use of nuclear weapons. Although unlikely if Russia faces a conventional defeat in Ukraine, Mr. Putin may have to decide whether or not to implement his doctrine. This would represent a major crisis for the whole world. This is one of the main reasons why China actually warned Russia last time on the nuclear issue. It is not so much that the Beijing government fears that Russia is falling behind the US in terms of its arms industry, but rather that Putin could make a crazy move with nuclear weapons and destroy the entire global order. So, what is Beijing's response to the international backlash? Xi Jinping warned that China must be prepared to deal with the worst-case scenarios and be ready to withstand strong winds, choppy waters, and even dangerous storms. If Russia uses a tactical nuclear weapon, even if this is not the worst-case scenario, it will certainly create a dangerous storm. Chinese leaders would like to avoid this worst-case scenario if possible. After recent developments, they have expressed their discomfort with Russia's nuclear rhetoric and have tried to deter Moscow from further threats, albeit indirectly. China wants to increase its international standing and influence and play a greater role in global governance, according to the latest working paper.
if Moscow does indeed launch a nuclear strike, the ensuing international reaction will force Beijing to express some level of criticism or condemnation in order to assert itself as a responsible great power with moral authority and conviction. Such a scenario would undoubtedly be a major test for Sino-Russian relations, but it is by no means clear that China would completely sever ties. Even in the midst of monumental international outrage, Beijing may be sufficiently confident in its ability to avoid a significant backlash that it can only give a rhetorical response to a Russian nuclear strike. Chinese leaders have repeatedly tried to portray the U.S. and NATO as instigators in the Ukraine conflict to divert attention away from Russia. If Beijing can similarly deflect the resulting anger, the Sino-Russian relationship may be able to weather the storm, and such a path would allow China to position itself as a mature and principled great power, aims to seek win-win solutions, but Russia's nuclear weapons capability is still enough to ignite a global crisis. On the other hand, Russia is not the only party that China needs to rein in when it comes to nuclear weapons. North Korea, as we all know, is one of the first actors that comes to mind after Russia when it comes to nuclear weapons. On February 7th, just a month after testing a nuclear device that the North unconvincingly claimed was a hydrogen bomb, it launched an UNHA-3 satellite launch rocket into space. The expressions of outrage by the international community and regional neighbors, especially Japan and South Korea, were then as they are now. The UN Security Council duly convened an emergency meeting. The US State Department repeated its calls for additional international sanctions against North Korea, rejected by the rogue state's only nominal ally, China. The launch of the three-stage rocket, the second since December 2012, is widely seen as part of a program to develop intercontinental ballistic missiles. If modified to carry a 1,000-kilogram warhead instead of a satellite, UNA-3 could reach Alaska and possibly Hawaii, experts believe. To get a usable ICBM, North Korean scientists are presumably trying to master additional technologies. But for North Korea to do so, they would first need to build a nuclear warhead small enough to be placed on a missile. Second, they would need to design and build a re-entry vehicle to carry the warhead to its target. None of these steps is likely to be easy for North Korea. But the assumption is that if nothing happens to change the Kim Jong-un regime's strategic calculation that nuclear weapons are the ultimate guarantee of its survival, they will eventually get there. The only thing that could stop it would be for China to order its banks and companies to stop doing business there, threatening to pull the plug on the hermit kingdom's fragile economy. China fears that if the regime collapses, it would face both an influx of refugees from across the border into its northeast and the disappearance of a useful buffer between itself and America's ally to the south. So the current state of anxiety over North Korea is not without cost for China. It is embarrassing that China has so little influence over the actions of its smaller neighbor. Moreover, the Chinese side will view with concern the American desire to improve South Korea's missile defense. South Korea's acquisition of the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense, or THAAD, system to add to the Aegis system currently deployed on its naval destroyers, puts China in a difficult position. The U.S. says THAAD will focus only on the threat from North Korea, but China fears that if it is integrated with systems operated by Japan and the U.S., it will reduce the effectiveness of its own missile forces. For the moment, Xi Jinping does not seem ready to rein in Mr. Kim. Perhaps another reason for Xi's reluctance to try is that he is not sure he will comply. But Xi now seems to be absolutely obliged to restrain Mr. Putin because the first shots of a possible nuclear war are likely to come from Russia. If Russia is blocked by China on the use of nuclear weapons, North Korea may take the message in its stride and refrain from taking more daring steps. In other words, Russia is currently considered to be the center of the nuclear stalemate. As a result, there is a conception of China as an opponent of Russia. With the West growing increasingly impatient with this alliance, and with Mr. Xi's hopes of assuming a peacekeeping role having so far failed, he will calculate the risk of continuing to stand shoulder to shoulder with an international pariah 
he once called both comrade and dear friend. Thank you for following us.